Okay, well, thank you all for being here tonight. My name is Paul Griffin. I'm going to speak to you about Ukraine. Specifically, I'm going to be speaking about the protests that you all saw, saw on, the, on the news from late 2013 to early 2014, and these protests were called the Euromaidan protests. And what I'm going to argue in this presentation is that the main driving force behind the success of the Euromaidan protests were the Ukrainian nationalist right. This is some members here of the Ukrainian nationalist right. These are members of the Social Nationalist Assembly. Again, you can see that these were some of the most militant elements within the Euromaidan. You can see they're coming down here ready for a fight. I'd like to point out the chain that's been used um, uh, used against the riot police, which is known as the Bear Coop. Something in his hand here could be, could be spray paint, could be mace of, of some kind, bricks, sticks, everything being deployed against the police. So I'm just going to give you some background to begin with. So on the 21st of November 2013, the Ukrainian president, Viktor Yanukovych, suspended the association agreement with the European Union. He had been promising for months and months that Ukraine was going to move away from the Russian sphere of influence and towards ever closer union with uh, Europe. Almost immediately, the Euromaidan protests begin. They quickly spiral into violence. There was extreme violence on both sides, heavy fighting in the streets. You've seen the pictures of the fighters from the Social Nationalist Assembly on your left. On your right, the police were equally as savage. Kind of makes me laugh when students in this country when they're on their protests, they say the police use fascist tactics, the police are fascist. They really need to come down to Ukraine and see a real fascist police force. They, they, the, these are the Berkut riot police. They don't kettle you. They control you with live ammunition and Molotov cocktails. So on the 21st of February 2014, Euromaidan was victorious. Uh, they achieved their main goal, which was getting the president Viktor Yanukovych to concede power and then resign. But the biggest bombshell was on the 23rd of February 2014. For the first time in a long time in Europe, one part of a sovereign nation was annexed by another. Here you see Russian special forces annexing Crimea, taking control of the Sevastopol airport. Now this action by Russia was met by almost universal condemnation on the western side. A lot of political scientists such as Andreas Umland in Germany saying, saying that Russia's justification for annexing the Crimea was based upon lies, based upon propaganda. So Vladimir Putin said the reason that they, Russia decided to annex Crimea is that they had to protect Russian speakers. You have to remember that the eastern Ukraine is predominantly Russian speaking, the western Ukraine is predominantly Ukrainian speaking, and there's quite a cultural divide between the two. Putin said that Euromaidan was a coup executed by nationalists, neo-Nazis, Russophobes, and anti-Semites. Our own prime minister said that this is not the case. The blame for the crisis lies squarely with Russia. This is one of the more interesting pictures from Euromaidan in the center here. You see the Berkut riot police on your, on your right, and you see Euromaidan protesters on your left. These men here are most likely members of right sector, which we'll come to later. But I just want to show you this and the insignia on this makeshift shield. You see this thing that looks like a target, very common and very popular symbol within the white nationalist and uh, skinhead, uh, the white pride movements. It's the Celtic cross. But there's also these here, 14 and 88. Has anyone ever come across that before? Yes. Yeah. 14 stands for Adolf Hitler's most favored quote amongst these groups. 
which is we must preserve the purity of our race and a future for white children. 88, you take the eighth letter of the alphabet, which is H. 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 Heil Hitler. Now, just to put this into some international context, what, what I want you to do as I'm showing you these images, as I'm showing you the quotes from the Ukrainian nationalist right, is to try and imagine what would be happening if this situation was happening in the UK. So, I just want to tell you what the relationship is between David Cameron, the UAF, and the British far right. So, David Cameron likes to present himself as very much as an anti-fascist. He's a founding signatory, founding signatory of Unite Against Fascism. And there's his name right there on their website. UAF is a violent British Trotskyist counter-protest group that has received your taxpayers' money, funding from the central government, the local government, and of course the trade unions especially Unite. And eyewitnesses <coughs> allege that the UAF and the considerably more violent anti-fascist action membership overlap. Their main targets include Pegida, as well as the English Defense League in this country. This is typically what, what has happened in a EDL protest uh, as EDL were just starting out. This is a man who's decided to support the English Defense League on that day. There's his union flag there, and you can see he's being attacked by members of Unite Against Fascism. But David Cameron doesn't see the English Defense League as a good force in this country. He says that he's described some, some parts of our society as sick and that there's none, no part of society that's sicker than the EDL. So keep that in mind. This puts things into context. So the aims of this presentation are to demonstrate that David Cameron's view of Euromaidan in Ukraine and his criticism of Russia, as well as that of uh, Andreas Umland and other Western academics, is inconsistent, especially given his association with Unite Against Fascism. Whereas Putin's view of the Euromaidan is both rational and supported by evidence. Ukraine's nationalist right were an important contributor to Euromaidan's success. They provided, I'm going to demonstrate that they provided the defensive power, the raw power, the organization, the tactics, to make this a winning movement. And they also demonstrated internal influence. Moderates and leftists, on the other hand, demonstrated negligible influence. What I don't want to do is to give you that, the idea that I'm trying to rationalize or minimize the crimes of any totalitarian regime or militant group, as long as you understand that. We can continue. So, it's important to understand why exactly did the Ukrainian president, which is on the left there, Viktor Yanukovych, why did he flee? Why did he decide to leave Kiev on the 21st of February? This is him signing away presidential power. He's not fully resigning. He's signing away a lot of presidential power to the opposition. This is Ole Tyanovak, I think I'm pronouncing his name correctly, and uh, Vitaly Klitschko, who is now in, was in Ukrainian politics. Now, Viktor Yanukovych explained his leaving of Kiev on the 21st of February as being just a routine visit to Kharkov, nothing to worry about. He's still president. But eyewitnesses present at the time, such as Russian envoy Vladimir Lukin, said the prevailing mood on that last day was one of panic. And indeed, the routine visit to Kharkov certainly explains why he left Kiev. But what it doesn't explain is why he tried to destroy all of this incriminating evidence, all of these invoices, and, and why these things were found floating in the Kiev reservoir the next day. So, 56 million Krivnas spent on monitoring mass media. This one in the middle here, over a million euros worth of wooden decor for his tea room in his residency. Oh. This one here, a document commissioning a running board decoration for nearly a hundred thousand, well, not well over nearly a million agreement. And you can see that these invoices are quite amateurishly destroyed. They were just thrown into the Kiev reservoir. 
half singed. So there was some, there was some panic there, definitely. But it's difficult to point to any single event that, that really convinced Yanukovych to leave. Because the preparations for him leaving Kiev actually began several days earlier before the 21st of February. And it's important to understand this is actually prior to the bloodiest days of the Europe Maidan shootings and prior to the signing away of much of his presidential power. So again, difficult to point to one single event. Probably, what I think, is it, sl is it slowly dawned on him what Euromaidan was all about and that it would win in a war of attrition. Uh, the Euromaidan movement, to compare it to the Orange Revolution that happened some years earlier, was deeply anti-Yanukovych, whereas the Orange Movement, not so much. A, uh, Yanukovych's resignation was one of the demands of Euromaidan, whereas the Orange Revolution simply wanted a recount of a, of a vote in an election. Also, Euromaidan was very competently militant, as I, as I will demonstrate. They had the defensive power and the internal influence in organization to show that it would win in a war of attrition against the state. And what I'm going to argue now is how the Ukrainian nationalist right was an important contributor to both points. I'm going to introduce some of the main players on the Ukrainian nationalist right in the next few slides. This is right sector, uh, fighters from right sector taking an oath-taking ceremony. Uh, I just want you to remember this insignia here. And when we come to right sector later on, So, in order to really to understand Ukraine's nationalist right, you have to understand the historical figure of Stepan Bandera, who's on the left here. Now, Stepan Bandera has a very, very cool name, but he's an incredibly controversial figure within uh, Ukraine. Mostly, uh, most of his support uh, historically uh, comes from the western side. He's not particularly well thought of on the eastern side. He was the leader of the Ukrainian insurgent army, which was a guerrilla force. Some fighters on your right there that, that were active in the 1930s and the 1940s. They waged a guerrilla campaign against Poland, the Soviet Union, as well as Nazi Germany towards the end. Now, the Ukrainian insurgent army has been accused of war crimes against Polish, Jewish, and Soviet civilians. This is what makes them uh, highly controversial in Ukraine. Now, Vladimir Putin calls Stepan Bandera the accomplice of Hitler. Indeed, there was an inconsistent alliance with Nazi Germany at the start of World War II, as they both joined forces to fight the common enemy of the Soviet Union. Uh, as the war progressed and uh, the Soviet Union was beaten back, uh, Stepan Bandera said that he wanted an independent Ukraine, which was inconsistent with Germany's doctrine of Lebensraum. So he found himself in Sachsenhausen concentration camp for a few years. As the war started to turn against Germany, he was then redeployed against the Soviet Union. But by this point, he was his, him and his fighters were engaging not only uh, Soviet targets, but also Nazi targets as well. So does that look familiar to anyone? This is a flag of the Ukrainian insurgent army. And it's also the flag of right sector. So right sector are positioning themselves as being the ideological heirs of the Ukrainian insurgent army. So I just want to introduce, but first of all, I want to introduce this other far-right party in Ukraine called Sloboda. Now, Sloboda means freedom in Ukrainian. I think it also means uh, freedom in Russia as well. But just to give you a sense of what, who, who these people are, what, what sort of uh, ideology they have. So on your left is the very young, charismatic leader of, of Svoboda, Tsyanabuk. He's uh, highly intelligent. He's a surgeon by trade. And all, um, well, Stepan Bandera is someone that he uh, looks up to very much so personally. So at a private meeting, 
uh, which was praising the Ukrainian insurgent army and their actions. He said that you were the ones, the Ukrainian insurgent army, that the Muscovite Jewish mafia running Ukraine fears the most. And he also said of the, of the Ukrainian insurgent army, they took their automatic guns on their necks and they went to the woods and they fought against Muscovites, Germans, Jews, and other scum that wanted to take away our Ukrainian state. So his words, not mine, giving you, just giving you an example of where these, where these individuals are coming from. This is the young advisor, Yuri Mikol Shishin. He is author of the blog, the Joseph Goebbels Institute of Political Research. <laughs> he later changed this to the Ernst Jünger Institute of Political Research. And when asked about the Holocaust, he considers it a bright period for Europe. So these are the kind of, these are the individuals that uh, were active in Euromaidan. This symbol in the middle is uh, Svoboda's insignia. This stands for three glasses of vodka, please. So it presents itself as a populist working man's party. There's no real, well, I guess if you wanted to find an analog uh, for Svoboda in the UK, you would have to look at the fringes of the National Front, really. Now onto right sector. I pointed out what the right sector insignia is. It's just a slightly modified Ukrainian insurgent army flag. So again, presenting themselves as the ideological heirs of Stepan Bandera. Now, right sector is actually was just created just before the, uh, the Euromaidan, and it, it's actually an umbrella organization uh, that covers several of the smaller, more ex more extreme uh, far right parties within Ukraine. It includes the Stepan Bandera, all Ukrainian organization Trident, of which Dmitry Yarosh on the right, uh, sorry on the left, is uh, the leader of the Ukrainian National Assembly, the Social Nationalist Assembly, quite what the difference is between a Social Nationalist and a National Socialist is, is anybody's guess. Uh, the White Hammers, they're very, very interesting. Uh, they're called White Hammers, first white because they're ethno-nationalists, and hammers because their way of extracting party funds is by taking sledgehammers to vending machines and slot machines. And also, possibly the most formidable members of right sector are the Afghan and Chechen war veterans uh, who are very well represented with uh, real battle experience. And Svoboda and right sector collaborated very, very closely in Euromaidan. But some of the interviews with right sector, they say Svoboda, uh, they're kind of too politically correct for me. That's why I, that's why I joined right sector. So what I'm going to demonstrate now is that the Ukraine's nationalist right contributed to Euromaidan's success by providing its defensive power, its staying power, its, uh, its raw power in terms of, and also uh, power in terms of tactics and strategy, as well as maintaining internal influence and authority within Euromaidan, and that the influence of moderates and leftists was far weaker in comparison. So first of all, organization. On your left is Andre Parubi, who is uh, an ex-Svoboda member. He is a founding member of Svoboda, in fact. And he found himself uh, in the position of commandant of Euromaidan Self-Defense Committee. So he was running the show when it came to uh, Euromaidan Self-Defense. A report would later remark that without the ta nationalist tight organization, the revolt on the Maidan Square would have largely collapsed. So you have a man who's, who's ideological history is from Svoboda leading uh, leading this protest movement and giving it its staying power. A lot of these individuals here, have seen this picture before, will be right sector members, possibly Svoboda members as well. Um, right sector and Svoboda, especially the, and the men that they deployed on the ground, uh, again, a lot of them are war veterans and others are drafted from uh, the, the terraces of uh, Dynamo Kiev. So they're hardened football hooligans and, uh, and more than willing to get up and close and personal with the police. And you can see that there's, that these people gave Euromaidan a great staying power. Here on the, here on the right you see government-sponsored thugs, 
known locally as Tetushki, being captured and detained by the Euromaidan fighters. And these look like some pretty rough boys, but they, you can see in his eyes, he knows he's in trouble. Written on his, written on his forehead is slave in Ukraine. So, Soboda was a major contributor in terms of tactics and strategy. So, I mentioned that the protest began on the location on the left here, which is the Euromaidan, sorry, the Independence Square, also known as locally as the Maidan in Kiev. It's a large open square, um, and the problem is, is that it's accessible from several sides at once, which makes it quite vulnerable to attack. It's also quite difficult for um, to hide what you're doing if you're wanting to mask for an attack. But Svoboda changed the situation. On the 1st of December 2014, Svoboda decided to leave Maidan and attack the trade union building in Kiev. And this was a turning point. Suddenly, Euromaidan had a foothold within Kiev, an actual defendable foothold. Imagine the building is far more defendable, uh, and it would form also, as I mentioned, the HQ for Euromaidan, which gave them a gave them a building for a field kitchen, field hospital, a training ground, <coughs> as well as English language courses, and a press area, and a podium for all man manners of speeches, including, uh, ironically, the history of nonviolent protest movements. So, now some people would say, ah, oh, but they were also supported by Fatherland Party activists as well. Well, I would just direct them to this image on the left. Now, this is the interior of Euromaidan. Clearly, the far right held authority here. You can see the Svoboda flags. You can see the Celtic cross flag. There's even a Confederate flag in the back. Now, in terms of defensive power and maintaining internal influence, again, the far right, Svoboda, right sector, these were the people that held the authority. So I'd just like to introduce you to one of the militant groups of a more moderate, more leftist uh, character. This is Spilna Sprava, or Common Cause. And on the 24th and 26th of January 2014, they began to copy the Svoboda tactic of seizing, uh, seizing buildings. And they seized the Justice Ministry, and the Agricultural Ministry, and the Energy Ministry, as well as the foyer of the City Hall. Now, Svoboda looked at this and they said, and right sector looked at, this, looked at this and they said, well, that's all well and good, but there's one little problem. You did this without our permission. So, what they did with the Justice Ministry is that they approached Spilnes Brava. Uh, the story goes that they approached Spilnes Brava in the, while they held, held the building and asked them to, if they could come inside and help them defend the building against the police. They came in, they went inside the building, the police showed up, getting ready to evict Spilna uh, Sprava from the building as well as Svoboda by this point. Um, Svoboda told them to go out and meet the police and that they would be right behind them. Spilna Sprava went out, Svoboda locked the door behind them, and then they went up to the top of the, of the building, grabbed the fire hose, and started to spray both Spilnes Brava and the police with the freezing cold water, and this was in the middle of January in Ukraine, which would have been absolutely miserable. So, it really goes to show how resourceful Svoboda was, how cunning they were. They were able to use this uh, non-lethal, um, non-lethal method uh, and, and, and do something 100% effective. When it came to the agricultural ministries and the energy ministries and the city hall, they weren't as patient with Spilnes Brava and, and Svoboda actually ejected them using uh, rubber bullets, grenades, and in some cases live ammunition. Now, it, was, it emerged later that the reason that Svoboda had done this is because they were living up to a prisoner amnesty bargain with the Yanukovych regime. The, the idea was that if Svoboda could get Spilnes Brava out of these buildings, then they would, then the, uh, Yanuko, the Yanukovych regime would release some of the prisoners that they had taken from the Euromaidan fighters. So, what's the point I'm trying to make is that 
Yanukovych and, uh, and his government, when they were wanting to negotiate and deal with Euromaidan, they weren't coming to the moderates, they weren't coming to uh, Klitschko, they weren't coming to uh, any of the other moderates, they were coming directly to Svoboda. So clearly, Svoboda and right sector have clear influence, clear authority within Euromaidan. Now, on the other hand, I've just demonstrated how uh, how Svoboda and right sector were able to have free reign, and uh, and moderates weren't able to have free reign. So Svoboda and right sector were able to act pretty much completely independently and pursue their own uh, their own propaganda projects. So on the eighth of December two thousand thirteen, this was an early uh, propaganda earthquake in Ukraine. Uh, Svoboda activists. Uh, converged on the site of Lenin's statue in Kiev. Uh, the communists guarding the statue ran away, and then immediately Svoboda decided to put a noose around the statue of Lenin's neck, and with the sheer force of the crowd was able to yank it down, and then they were, uh, Lenin's statue was smashed to pieces with sledgehammers, as you can see on this image here. Now a bus full of Berkut uh, riot police arrived on the scene, but they dared not leave the bus. So Soboda was actually able to intimidate the riot police on this occasion. And this happened again on the 10th of January 2014. Uh, Ukrainian nationalists had destroyed a similar statue of Lenin in the town called Borisville outside of Kiev. And the 10th of January 2014 was the date of their trial and sentencing. Uh, they were sentenced and found guilty, uh, but immediately Svoboda activists and fighters converged on the courtroom, shut down the trial, preventing the defendants from leaving, as well as the judiciary from leaving as well. Again, a bus full of Berkut arrived at the scene, uh, but Svoboda immediately surrounded the bus, started to tip it over, the Berkut riot police actually surrendered, but then they had to run the gauntlet of hundreds of Svoboda fighters and, uh, and activists. Now, a particularly impressive piece of propaganda from Svoboda came on the 2nd of January 2014, which was a procession in the honor of Stepan Bandera's 105th birthday, which is uh, on the following slide. You really get a sense of how deeply ingrained Stepan Bandera is as an almost uh, as a folk here almost within within Western Ukraine. You can see that his support attracts really quite a broad church, and now uh, literally part of the church as well. Uh, you can see it attracts members of the priestly class. There's women, there's children, young and old, all converging on uh, Kiev to celebrate his 105th birthday. And you can see the Svoboda flags in the background with the three fingers, and you can just about see the right sector flags towards the center uh, in the background as well. Now, moderates immediately condemned this, and uh, Vitaly Klitschko is more of a moderate. He said that this had nothing to do with the Euromaidan, and he's, he's right in a official sense. I mean, commemorating, commemorating Stepan Bandera is not one of the stated aims of, my, of the Euromaidan. Um, Andrei Kirkov said that uh, he doesn't understand why this is happening because Kiev is a peaceful, tolerant city. Uh, Andrei Kirkov is a, one of Ukraine's most celebrated authors and also an eyewitness to the events of Euromaidan. But their voices would have sounded feeble in the Euromaidan headquarters. There is Stepan Bandera. And also, a Banderite slogan, Glory to Heroes, Glory to Ukraine, became the official slogan of Euromaidan. So, in summary, Western experts and leaders, including David Cameron, and also other political scientists, such as Andreas Omland, have overlooked the contribution of Ukraine's nationalist right to the success of Euromaidan. And all evidence that I've presented to you suggests that Ukraine's nationalist right were really indispensable contributors to Euromaidan's defensive power, as well as uh, 
and they demonstrated clear internal influence and control, and that, on the other hand, moderates and leftists really didn't display any notable influence. So, and what I'd like to point out really that there's an inconsistency here in the treatment of the alleged far right in this country and the domestic and, uh, and foreign far and the foreign far right in other countries. So, my recommendation is the words of none other than Enoch Powell. In 1959, Enoch Powell stood up and he went against his own party to speak out about the treatment of Kenyan natives under the British colonial rule. He said that we can't have one rule for Britain and one rule for Africa. Instead, he appealed to a higher morality. He said, we must be consistent with ourselves everywhere. And if we are going to be taken seriously as a country on the international stage and trusted on the international stage, we must be consistent in both England, Britain, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, as well as the rest of the world. And that, of course, includes Ukraine. So I'd like to thank you for listening. And are there any questions? Um, thank you, Paul, for an excellent presentation. Oh, thank you. Um, I have um, uh, one question and maybe one observation. The question is, uh, but surely there were also Western uh, outside influences which played a role in the Maidan. I can't believe that the United States did not have a role and uh, people like... Um, they certainly did. Uh, Victoria Newland, who's the Secretary of State, basically said who she wants in as, uh, as the main player in the, in the opposition. She didn't like Vladimir Klitschko. Um, she much preferred uh, Yatsenyuk, who was the Prime Minister right. for some time, uh, President, I mean, for some time. Probably I would have thought yeah. some also some uh, presence on the ground by CIA agents and agents provocateurs, American uh, secret services. I mean, it's an open secret. For quite, the, uh, quite possibly. There is a rumor yeah. that, a, that a senior member of right sector attended secret meetings in Washington before uh, the events of Euromaidan. Um, it's, I haven't seen that rumor being substantiated in any way, though. However. But I was thought Soros, mm. someone like Soros, who mm. plays a big role in Eastern Europe, yeah. trying to yeah. uh, peddle. Uh, well, apparently, over, it's over $5 million were actually spent in pro democracy. They call it pro democracy initiatives. I mean, uh, who knows what that really means in Ukraine. And yeah, a lot of that, some of that, um, uh, well, most of that's come from actually American. Uh, state money, but a lot of it, like you said, will come from Soros as well, his uh, Open Society Institute, right. and that is, I believe, has actually just recently been been banned as an organization in Russia because of its uh, subversive uh, yes. uh, influences. But the observation is this. Now, the question of nationalism. Mm. Now, nationalism does, if you look back on European history, the cases of Germany, Italy, during the 19th century, in a way, you can see the rationale for it when the nation perceives themselves right. as oppressed or discriminated, mm -hmm. occupied by foreigners and so on, there would be a powerful factor in national. Now, in the case of Ukraine, now I, I should premise, I, I think of this uh, obsessive um, Western, particularly British, campaign against Putin is insane. <laughs> they try to rerun the, the Cold War when, the, of course, the prime motive of Cold War, an expansive ideology like communism, has gone. <laughs> so I'm a totally opposed. I've actually written about this insane hatred of Russia. However, if um, many Ukrainians see themselves as having a right to independence, on the grounds of their own uh, 
uh, as you pointed out, there are two Ukraines. One is uh, gravitators Pole and the Catholics on the other Ukraine, which is more towards uh, the Moscow Patriarchate, Russia, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. So in a way, it's a difficult one. But sorry, what I'm leading up to is how do you, quite apart from the Svoboda and the uh, right sector and so on, how do you see the question of Ukrainian? Does Ukrainian nationalism have well, I completely uh, have a, a, some kind of grab. I completely understand why Ukrainians are so, especially Western Ukrainians, are so attracted to nationalism. And the reason is is because Ukraine really has had a miserable history as a as a nation. It's gone through um, forced famine, the whole Automar, uh, which is a genocide um, enacted by the Soviet Union so, upon the Ukrainian people. Yeah, um, it's recognized as such by the European Court of Human Rights, I believe. Um, now over. Up to seven million people died in that in that famine. Most of them in the east, actually. Um, and also, Ukraine's been invaded from multiple sides. It's been controlled uh, by the Germans at one point, controlled by the Soviet Union. Parts of it have been controlled by Poland. Really, it's a borderland between different empires. So, what this history has demonstrated to the Ukrainian people is that the is that the only people they can rely on and trust is themselves. And I think that's that's why nationalism is so. Uh, popular as an ideology, especially in Western Ukraine, we get a radically different political climate um, in Ukraine compared to what we have in Britain, because Britain, of course, has changed hands um, between many different peoples, but none of it is within recent memory. Yes, in fact. Was the 14 words which means David Lane, are they? Sorry? Uh, 14 words. Yeah. Um, some people say it's one of the one of the quotes either by David Lane or, or Hitler. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So I can make a comment about England. Mm -hmm. I think the thing about Ukraine it has no borders. Mm -hmm. Everybody can come and invade, and they bloody well have. Mm -hmm. And we have or had this wonderful channel, which defended us. Mm -hmm. But I think it's made us soft. We've forgotten that we maybe need to be defended. What would you say about? That? And quite possibly, I think. I think. Uh, well, it's actually it's, it's a very almost Russian uh, Dostoevsky idea. The idea that suffering is, is in some shape or form is necessary for character growth. Um, yeah, there there may be some truth to that. Although although obviously, I wouldn't want to see a famine in Britain. I wouldn't want to see it uh, changed hands. But but uh, having a Having an understanding what, of what the lowest common denominator is would definitely, definitely help Britain. Did you have a question? You uh, yeah, um, I was just wondering if, if this is all true and uh, the right was so dominating this whole thing, why are the moderates uh, still supporting this, this revolution? Because uh, Klitschko, for example, clearly uh, supports oh, well, it. Yeah, and most, it. most people mm. I talk to. Uh, absolute diehard defenders. Uh, we're not neo Nazis. Mm -hmm. Absolute diehard defenders of, of this. Of this. Well, uh, Yanukovych was deeply um, unpopular by this point. Like I said, he's incredibly corrupt. Uh, also, allegations of a criminal past as well. I believe uh, it was either assault or rape uh, was the allegations against him um, in his youth, uh, which, uh, in most cases, that would bar you from running for running for office. Uh, also, a lot of political dissidents had either disappeared or been killed under mysterious circumstances. So um, he even recognized himself that the Berkut had had um, uh, demonstrated, he said, uh, overzealous behavior in their treatment of the Euromaidan protesters. So uh, you don't have to be uh, a nationalist, a neo-Nazi, uh, anti-Semite, or anything like this in order to get on board with Euromaidan. But um, my point is that the, the people that actually got out there gave uh, Euromaidan staying power. Uh, we're not a bunch of um, students singing Kumbaya and listening to rock concerts. You know, it was these far rightists that were wanted to come here ready for a fight. Uh, football hooligans that wanted to come and, uh, and, uh, and, and take, um, take back their country for themselves. Yes. Speaking as a libertarian, and almost have to, being one, um, this simply brings home to me the awfulness of nationalism and, and politics. Mm. In all its guises, pretty much, you, you attract the worst, you 
soften the conscience of the, the, the better sorts, you oblige people to take sides when they see good on, and wrong on both sides. Mm-hmm. It, it's just awful, mm-hmm. bloody awful. Mm-hmm. Um, now, it's interesting as an explanation of why this side succeeded or why the other side succeeded. But uh, our view is that the important thing in your life is that um, there are other producers apart from yourself and you're trading with one another and um, there's saving, there's uh, security, there's a, uh, you leave me alone, I'll leave you alone, or mm-hmm. you can buy from me, I'll buy from you. This kind of view, and um, this kind of thing just, uh, no, it's, it's like reading the, um, it's like following the course of a disease or a tumour. It's, uh, you know, it's not uninteresting, but I, I don't want to applaud anybody here. Uh, it's just so sad that they saw the need to take sides, whereas I can be of use to you, or at least no harm to you, and you can be of use to me, or at least no harm to me, in, in a commercial world. Uh, you may agree with this, but the point is, this is just very depressing. Mm. It's, it's not inspiring, it's not, in a sense it's not educational. I mean, I know this sort of stuff goes on. Yeah. So. It's, it's following. Can I make a comment? With Islam now, in Europe, you cannot ignore it. You cannot say, oh, it's a terrible thing, and I'm an libertarian, but I'll ignore it. You cannot ignore it. What are you going to do about it? And do nothing. Do nothing. Do nothing. Yes. You might not have that luxury. The, uh, the liberal uh, doctrine of being for the age is freedom of religion. No matter how absurd these religions are, I, I personally find Christianity pretty absurd. I find Judaism but pretty absurd. But peaceful. That's the and, point. And I, I find Islam pretty absurd. Uh, but uh, the liberal position is uh, freedom of religion. That is a liberal position, it, but it's also it, nonsense, surely. No, it's not nonsense. Uh, what is nonsense is what we've been listening to, as Bob said, for the last half hour, people uh, exercising in complete folly, destroying wealth, uh, occupying themselves full time to kill and murder other people, and uh, instead of progress, regress can only come out of this. It can only lower the standard of living forever. Can that is, you don't ignore Well, the, the only good thing you allow them freedom of religion. That's the liberal position. Then think about what is their religion? What does it mean? It doesn't seem to be very peaceful to me. Um, I was in Kiev once, ten years ago, visiting a friend who was at the American Embassy, actually, as well as another friend who was um, Dmitry Volodnikiv, who is a Ukrainian nationalist and not a member of Svoboda. He's now a Ukrainian diplomat in Rome. And um, uh, concerning actually religion, in this case the uh, Ukrainian, uh, set up, struck me that there were three uh, different patriarchates in Kiev at the time. One was a patriarchate in communion with Moscow, and my friend Dimitri belonged to that patriarchate, while at the same time being a very strong nationalist. Right. And when he was in London visiting me, we, we saw a statue of St. Volodymyr in Kensington, mm-hmm. I don't know if you are aware of it, as St. Volodymyr is a patron saint of Ukraine. Right. And Dimitri started singing the Ukrainian national anthem, whatever that was. But anyway, but there was also a patriarchate, a distant patriarchate, of some um, bishop who quarreled with a Moscow patriarchate because he had not been given preferment. And was a third patriarchate in communion with the patriarch Constantinople. Mm-hmm. So it was a very fragmented situation, as well as I was impressed by the great spirituality of the Orthodox Church. I'm an, I mean, I'm an Anglican, but I'm an admirer of the Orthodox Church. Um, sorry, uh, can you say anything about the religious? Do um, uh, you know anything about how, which sides of the Ukrainian? I know, church? I know that Ukraine is split, split east and west. Uh, the western side is predominantly Catholic. And uh, I don't know much about the intricacies of the of the uh, Orthodox religion, but I know that. Um, well, right, they actually, really they left out of the unions uh, who are actually Orthodox and uh, Catholics, Roman Catholics, right. in Orthodox garb. They're in communion with Rome, right. and they are um, much frowned upon by fellow real Orthodox. That's that's, for, that's interesting. Yeah. I haven't heard of them before. Um, the East tends to be more Orthodox. 
because of the influence of Russia. And we found, and in the early stages of Euromaidan, uh, the head of the Orthodox Church in Kiev um, was was very very critical of uh, of any protesting occurring. Um, he basically said that people shouldn't protest; they should use democratic methods. Um, so he possibly is more influenced by the Russian side. Uh, but I don't, I don't know a lot about the intricacies of, um, of, the, of the two religions. Uh, yes, yeah, so I've got a couple of questions to ask. First of all, can, I, can you just state again what you stated at the end, just exactly what you, you were complaining about? Well, the problem is, is that in our country, um, groups like Pegida and the EDL really are vilified by the media, and they're thought to be something that's incredibly dangerous. Uh, Enoch Powell is thought to be someone with dangerous ideas, but well, not these. Yes, yes. Right. Okay. But but the but the EDL um, compare that to Svoboda, compare that to right sector, not nearly as uh, extreme, not nearly as violent. Uh, most uh, UAF and anti-fascist action are more violent than uh, than the EDL. If if, in, in, if you want to look at the evidence, I mean, just recently in Scarborough. Uh, there was an EDL protest there. I've never been on an EDL protest myself. I've never seen one in action. I just read about it. But 150 EDL members in Scarborough at once, and for the first time in a long time, they actually outnumbered Unite Against Fascism, um, which is the nightmare scenario for Unite Against Fascism. They're saying, you know, this is what we can't have. We can't let these fascists have control of the streets. But what happened is that no one from the EDL side was arrested, but three people from UAF were arrested. Similarly, years ago as well, in, in Sheffield. Well, may, maybe the EDL people didn't commit any criminal offenses. Well, exactly, exactly, and, that, and that's why they weren't arrested. Yeah. Because they, because they are, they are generally uh, law-abiding and want, and, and there is more people within the EDL that want to work with the police, whereas some elements within UAFs and especially anti-fascist action, they pride themselves on not working with the police because their groups run by communists, Trotskyists, people of other far-left persuasions as well, militant far-left persuasions. So what's UAF? UAF is a Unite Against Fascism and that is an organization that has received um, government support and, uh, and money in the past. I think they lost their grant recently. But, they, but when, whenever you hear in the news that, you know, EDL outnumbered by anti-fascist protesters or BNP outnumbered by anti-fascist protesters or something like that, you, you will, most, most of the protesters there will be either from UAF, uh, anti-fascist action, or some of the student unions, and then also some of the trade union members come down there as well, because they're all motivated by the same uh, ideology, which is... Uh, it's a, it's a far left ideology, a, a Trotskyism, and they'll tell you quite unashamedly that they're all Trotskyists. And it's just such an ironic situation that we have these people who are of the communist and Marxist tradition. Over a hundred million people have been killed by communism, um, and but and which is more than Hitler, Mussolini, General Franco, General Pinochet put together. It certainly that's, shows that's the, the biggest killer in the 20th century was not racism, but... Government control. Well, Secondary communism, religion. statism, whatever. Mm. Secular religion. Well, bugs me is that, um, I mean, I belong to Unite, not because I want to belong, but because I belong to a professional association, which I will not mention now, <laughs> which automatically is affiliated to Unite. So indirectly, I give some money to Unite, but now, thank you for making me aware of this, I will disaffiliate it, because I don't want to support uh, United Against Fascism. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, absolutely no way. That's a very wise decision, because... Um, David, thanks, I think. Yeah, because it's, it's, it's absolutely... It, it's, a it's just a ridiculous situation that we're being lectured to, you know, on the dangers of patriotism, on the dangers of uh, any sort of group feeling, by a bunch of... By a bunch of communists. Come on. <laughs> exactly. Well, uh, Hayek said in his book, The Road to Serfdom, in 1944, uh, that uh, the, the, the uh, difference between what's called the far left and what's called the far right was approximately zero. You know, it's a verbal difference rather than a theoretical difference. 
And uh, of course, this is the case. Uh, and what what they've done, uh, what the Fabian did, of course, in the uh, in the late 19th century, was it said that uh, socialism was to the left of liberalism. Uh, well, of course, it wasn't to the left of liberalism. It was, in fact, largely old Tory ideas uh, being revived. Uh, and uh, so, so, really speaking, the difference between Lenin and Hitler is, is a verbal difference. One is in German, the other is in Russian, that's part of it. But also, Lenin's got more of an elaborated uh, uh, ideology. But basically, it boils down to the same totalitarian system. <laughs> and of course, some people point out to me uh, that, uh, well, uh, the Russians didn't uh, bash the Jews so much. But of course, uh, the uh, word for Jew bashing is a Russian word. Uh, what was it? Pogrom. Pogrom is a Russian word. And so, when you've got a tradition of Jew bashing, you don't have to make it uh, an explicit policy. It's already there. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, basically, the, the difference between Bolshevism really and uh, and uh, Nazism is, I would say, about, about zero. Uh, but then you see what the, the result of the Fabian is that you've now got two right wings, as it goes. You know, the Libertarian Alliance, believe it or not, is called right wing, although it's, traditional, uh, uh, it's a traditional liberal uh, organisation and would, be, would traditionally be, a, uh, would have been, up to about, uh, up to about the 18. Uh, 70s or so, called the left wing organisation, communism, free trade, uh, this sort of stuff. This would be traditional left wing stuff, but it's now called right wing. Why? Because we oppose the Bolsheviks, because we oppose the communists, who are supposed to be left. So now, because we oppose the communists, we're supposed to be right. Well, that's, you know, so the, the left wing and right wing now is, is really owing to the Fabian society. Uh, uh, a ragtag and bobtail sort of, uh, you know, it's a, it's a mess. But all this is down to the Fabian Society, mm -hmm. suggesting that socialism was to the left of liberalism. Uh, if you can correct me, just by realising that socialism is just a new way for new uh, word for Toryism, and it's to the to the right of liberalism. Mm -hmm. And then you go Lenin and Hitler on the same side. How are we going to uh, classify these? Whether you go to the left or right? If you have, if you've got a big difference between Lenin and Hitler, then you've got it wrong. Lenin and Hitler are virtually identical. Is this a question? What was ball on the other? No, it's no question. It's just there is a gentleman in the, in the room. Uh, we, we, we don't. We don't. We just uh, our questions. We, we don't only ask questions. We also make statements. And I think that we need to make a statement and because what I said earlier on, what we've seen is is a, a catalogue of folly. What what has given rise to this folly? And uh, I think that what has given rise to this folly is a, a deliberate uh, ignoring of the liberal ideal, and and the solution to this folly is more respect for the liberal, for the liberal ideal. The liberal uh, ideal. I was, sorry, I was about to say there's a gentleman in the room and, and others who would point out that the left-right division of political opinion is um, almost willfully uh, confusing, uh, unhelpful. It's almost, it, it, it is almost deliberately unhelpful. It's now known to be not the way of doing things. You, how, can you, how can you position libertarians on a left-right spectrum? But well, the BBC they, is just far oh, away. They, they, oh, they will do it. Yes, yes, they will do it. In, in fact, one of the things about the um, uh, most anti-fascists, uh, often they don't have any very sophisticated socialist uh, beliefs. What they have, uh, which is uh, quite popular generally, but in an extreme form, in extreme form, is physical correctness, and they're actually physically correct fascists who could, if, you know, would if they could, impose extreme political correctness on it. I mean, that, that's, is that uh, the sort of political correctness that uh, when somebody tells a joke about the Welsh or something, mm -hmm. the police knock on their door, it's questionable, yeah. which is just ridiculous. Yeah. That's, that is going down <laughs> a road of uh, political correctness. It is turning into something totalitarianism and these people are exactly that, that politically correct fascists. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, if I could be finished. <laughs> Just very quickly, I mean the, the, the very few of them right there, EDL mm -hmm. and Padiga people mm -hmm. that I know certainly wouldn't call themselves fascists. No, absolutely not. You know, they, they, I mean, they got they had some points that the logo of Pegida is a man putting the swastika as well as the communist flag yeah. in the bin in the yeah, trash. So, for a I mean, they, they wouldn't. They're truck with fashion. They would like to be called fashion. Mm. They, you know, they have, well, 
they have very straightforward points. I have, um, but, I have observed a Pegida rally myself, uh, the first one that happened up in Northumberland, uh, sorry, in, uh, in Newcastle, and what I saw there was not reported on the news. Yeah, the only, the, yeah, but that happens all the time. Yeah, but I'll, I'll, but um, if, if you let me uh, yeah. explain. Um, the Golden Dawn, have you heard of the Golden yeah, Dawn? That's yeah, active yeah, in Greece. Yeah. Supporters from the Golden Dawn actually showed up at, at Pegida and wanted to join and actually brandishing the Golden Dawn flag, tried to uh, cut across the no man's land and get into the, into the uh, Pegida rally. And they were turned away by Pegida, um, really quite forcibly. This was not presented um, in the mainstream media. They took the pictures of the Golden Dawn and then no explanatory note to say that they were actually turned away. And I, I saw it with my own two eyes that they were that they were turned away. That gave me first hand, um, first hand experience and understanding of, of what what the game that the that the media plays. Yeah, uh, um, I mean, there's a lot of misreporting. I mean, I mean, the BBC is is renowned for that. I and mean, if you watch a, the Russian TV, you know, yeah, Russian, they, they yeah. point out to all the BBC misgivings. Mm -hmm. But anyway. Um, I mean, Russian people I've spoken to about this whole scenario, for example, they, they often quote this kind of thing. They say, look, if Mexico was having some kind of political disturbance mm -hmm. and the, the United States' main naval base was in Mexico, right. and um, the, Rus the Russians sent two of their top people, top government people, as uh, the United States did to the Ukraine. Yeah. Madeleine Albright, Secretary of State, I believe. Before uh, all this, Victoria Victoria uh, Newland was there, and John McCain was there. Actually, uh, and John McCain and John shook McCain. hands with the leader yeah, yeah. of Svoboda yeah. and sent their top people to stir up trouble. Mm. Yeah, yeah. With a country that bordered, not only bordered uh, a superpower, mm -hmm. but also housed its main military uh, naval base. Yeah. How do you think the United States was react? They said, well, I'll tell you how they react. They would invade straight away. There wouldn't be any question. There'd be an invasion. I suspect there'd be no ifs and buts about it. Now, yeah. Russia never done that. Yeah. And they say, well, look, all Russia done is said, look, in the Crimea, for example, let's have a referendum. Mm -hmm. We won't invade. We will put no boots on the ground. We'll just have a referendum, which is what they did. Mm -hmm. And the people in the Ukraine voted to go with uh, Russia. Mm -hmm. And they say, OK, well, let's look at your Let's look at Britain, Northern Ireland. <laughs> 30 years, I don't know how many thousands of people were killed. How many British boots on the ground they were there. Uh, no, na no major naval base. They'll point all this out. <laughs> and, you know, they'll say, look, uh, Russia was using a very soft glove here. It was, it was their territory. NATO has got no business being they have no business being in the East. <laughs> no business being in Eastern Europe, let alone in the Ukraine. Mm -hmm. British troops are there. They are, there's no doubt about that. I mean the government's admitted that. I think there is doubt. The there's no doubt at all. British, British troops in Ukraine, I don't think so. Yes, no, there no, there's no secret about it. Well, there are I mean, there are British there. mercenaries operating no. that were no, 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 no mercenaries, the British Army is in the Ukraine. I'm not 100% so convinced about that. Well, no, but no, no, I, will, I will meet you halfway and say mercenaries, well, at least one mercenary. Well, Cameron announced that in Parliament. There's no secret. Uh, he, announced, he announced it in Parliament. Did he? Okay. Indirectly, uh, on your interpretation, possibly. British troops are there. I mean, it's, it's, it's acknowledged that they're there. Russian troops are. As far as we know, there's no definite. I mean, the yeah, Russia yeah, said, look, well, they, they haven't got anything. Yeah. They might have sneaked some in without right. anyone knowing. Mm -hmm. But they're not British. There's no, there's no question. I mean, they've admitted it. There is question about it. So. The problem, the problem is that the average Briton on the streets, if you go to an East End pub, for example, which I'm in all the time every night, <laughs> people will say, look, what on earth? What are we doing in the Ukraine? What's it to do with us? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What are we doing in Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, Poland? Bulgaria, well, there's Croatia. A, there's a question of whether NATO should have been extended. But the Ukraine would be the, the, la the very last thing of all. And especially with all the end, with everything else which is going on, I mean, it's no wonder that the, the Brits just went out of Europe, the majority of them. 
Daily Express yesterday. Well, it's got to be said since we've since we've been in the EU, we've just got closer and closer to war with Russia. I don't see one um, one positive impact that the EU has had on this crisis, and even the Americans have said they've been completely useless privately. Well, that's a suspicion. It's a suspicion. Gorbachev did apply to join the EU, by the way. Remember that? Oh, yes. <laughs> so, I don't remember personally. Yeah. No, I think he did really, you're talking about a European homeland, remember? Well, true, true, has a market yeah, yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not his way, should it? So, Sorry, Dave, who did you apply to join? Oh, yeah, 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 that's right, yeah, yeah, well, yeah, sort of, yeah. And, and even NATO. That would have prevented his bloody thing, the Cold War, for, for good. You know, you know, United got here in part of Europe. If and that the Cold War really sprung up between Europe and America, which I always feared it would anyway, I mean, so much hatred for America in Europe. But, but, but uh, Putin uh, suggested that uh, Russia join NATO. Which is obviously rebuffed. I mean, that what would happen with the military industrial complex? <laughs> David, can we, can we repair the bar? Yes, I think we ought to stop. Thanks for the speech, Paul. Oh, yeah. Thanks very much. Very good. Appreciate very good. it. Very good. <laughs>